All right, so, uh, so thanks for joining our uh, Boston Office 365 user group tonight. Um, if you're not following us on all of our channels, please do so. We've actually uh, just caught up on the, all of the last month's YouTubes. So huge thanks to Mr. Pelleggi for, for taking care of that for us. Yay, David. Um, <clears throat> so just to meet the organizers, so my name is Dimitri Arapetov, and I'm with Turn Digital. With me, I have Mike uh, Dixon. Dimitri, your screen share just dropped out. So my name is Dimitri. I'm with Turn Digital, where we have Mike Dixon from Walking Street Consulting and David Pelleggi with Staples. If you have any questions or complaints, um, direct them to Dave. <laughs> so if you didn't have a chance to join us last time, um, we had a great session <laughs> with uh, Mr. Feldman. Um, so he gave us a, a, a great example and, and a number of walkthroughs for how we can build great business solutions uh, without having to write any code. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, definitely check that out on YouTube. All right, so we'd like to do a segment where we share some of the updates that we find most interesting since last time. I think there's about 80 or 90 updates since we've last met, but we've highlighted just a handful or so that we think are pretty cool. Um, so the first thing is that there will be a new uh, Teams pre-join experience. So if you have multiple microphones, headsets, speakers, audio devices, uh, I think we've all struggled with it at one point or another. We can now confirm what it's set to before we join the meeting. So pretty cool. And it also gives us the ability to test out those backgrounds before we dive in. Um, <clears throat> there's also a new feature that was inspired by some of the educational clients for Teams to be able to pick a user and really put them as the spotlight so that everyone sees them um, similar to how they would see a shared screen. Um, that way, if you have a speaker that's not sharing content, but you can still make sure everyone's able to see them front and center. Um, this is rolling out just about now and should be available to you by the end of this month. Um, another pretty cool feature is that Teams meetings are now going to um, have the ability to support up to 20,000 meeting attendees. So today you can have up to 300 people in a meeting like we're having right now. Um, the second that the next person joins, they would be told that the meeting is at capacity. With this new feature, um, you can still have 300 people join and interact just like we're interacting now, but all subsequent joinees up to 20,000 would be view only attendees. So this you know, allows them to still join in, although they might not be able to raise their hands or do some of the other features. Um, this will require um, an advanced communications license, uh, but pretty excited to see these numbers going up. Um, hey, yeah. Good question for you there. What's an advanced communications license? Is that brand new just for that, or is that something that already existed? Um, so this license has been around for a few weeks. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what else what else it includes, but I think this is one of the major things that it brings to become available. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it also expands the number of users you can have in a live event as well. And uh, Dimitri, do you know, is that something that's rolled into like an E5 license, i.e. the Cadillac of all licenses? <laughs> um, I'm not sure, to be completely honest. Um, I mean, there's other licenses that are not part of E5 that are tied to teams, like, for example, the calling plans. So yeah. I, th I think that's a good question. Um, moving forward, so um, we're seeing more and more clients using Microsoft Forms, uh, which is you know the, the SurveyMonkey equivalent tool within your enterprise. Um, they are Microsoft's rolling out a new mobile app so that it makes it easier to be able to to use and complete forms on a mobile device. Um, there's also another feature that didn't make it into the slides, but you can now also print out forms for offline use. So if you're <clears throat> printing stuff out. Um, you can have a better experience to print it as opposed to just your browser trying to print the form. Um, there's an, another new feature rolling out for Outlook for Android, where it will have a two-way sync with if you choose to use your native Android calendar. Um, personally, I like to use the Outlook app on my phone, but some people like to use the native apps because it has their personal content in there as well. Um, so this now will give you that ability to, to use one or both. Um, the search improvements that are coming, and, and I think you'll see a lot of talk about search next week at Ignite. But um, one of the features here is the ability to 
define the scope for where you're looking for files inside of OneDrive. So as you can see here in the top right corner, you now have the ability to limit searches to the current folder, including subfolders, um, or you know, scope it, branch it out a little bit further. This is rolling out now and should be done by the end of October. Um, yep, so that was on the last update. Of course, this doesn't capture all of the updates. We'd probably be here until tomorrow morning, but <clears throat> we just wanted to share these few. Um, so thanks to Turn Digital for sponsoring the user group. Um, <clears throat> they help us keep the lights on and all of our legal dues paid to be a, a nonprofit. So with that being said, um, we have the main event. We have a great presentation with um, Richard Harbridge. So Richard, without further ado, I'll pass it on to you. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Uh, so it should come through in a moment. So you guys should be able to see a groovy uh, slide deck. And uh, yeah, today the session focus is going to be uh, pretty interactive. I prefer questions. So uh, at any point in time, just like unmute, make noise, and I'll stop talking because um, I do talk pretty fast. <laughs> um, in the session content, essentially what I'm going to try and do is share um, tools and techniques that I've used over the years, um, some new stuff around road mapping, especially that's been really helpful for some people. Um, but I have a lot of hidden slides and other material we can cover depending on where the discussion goes. Um, so again, if you guys have questions, if you're not the type of person who wants to unmute and say something, just put it in the messages, like the Teams uh, messaging itself. And what I'll do is I'll try and keep one eye on it and double check it now and then in case there's a question. Of course, the hand is also really effective, so please use that as well. So without further ado, um, uh, many of you know me, but uh, for those who don't, my name is Richard Harbridge. I'm a chief technology officer of a company called Two to Lead. I have lots of branded stuff around me um, because I, I work there and I'm a uh, person who is really proud to work there. Um, so we do technology services consulting and a bunch of other stuff. But what I'm here today is, is to really start a conversation. So if you have questions beyond today, please reach out. Um, as everyone knows, I always say I'm super friendly and I really try and abide and live by that. So if you have uh, questions, uh, you want to jump on a one on one call, get prescriptive guidance, you know, for yourself, um, you know, doesn't matter what kind of business you run, uh, I'd love to connect with you. Um, so just for reference, I do have a beard now because of COVID, um, and uh, and so I, I do look a little different, and it's getting more and more disheveled as time passes, but uh, um, just a quick reference in case you're looking me up on social media. Um, so the goal today is to really just give you guys a little bit more confidence. Uh, at the end of the day, there's so many uh, ideas and techniques that we've all used, and so if we were to go through them all, we would you know easily spend a week uh, going through each person's experiences and, and best practices. What I really want want to do is I want to hit on some of the ones that I think are harder to find. So um, what I'm going to try and emphasize is the stuff that, you know, if you go and do a Google search or if you go and look at uh, Bing and you, you look for like particular results um, around the docs, uh, you know, the, the traditional uh, support.office.com stuff or even, you know, our wonderful community, it's sometimes hard to find guidance on some of these. So I've kind of cherry picked what I think are some key points. Um, and if you've heard some of them before, just ignore me and, uh, you know, play a game on your phone or something while we're working through this. Um, so, so that's the idea. Um, so we're going to do it in four bits today. Um, we're going to talk about aligning with Microsoft in our industry, then a bit of uh, scaling. Um, that's a really interesting topic for questions. So if you guys have questions on like, hey, what's your opinion on how we should manage teams or what are some of the big problems with teams today, uh, you know, versus like traditional SharePoint, uh, I can go on uh, in great detail about different experiences there. Um, and then we're going to talk about estimates and roadmaps. Um, pretty brief there, but uh, just a bit of a discussion mainly on roadmaps and then um, some tips and tricks on visualizing and communicating better. So, uh, so this is the, I, I really enjoy industry stats um, and some of those things. So I want to talk to you guys about um, two patterns, especially that I think are very dominant in the industry right now. Um, and then we'll kind of uh, transition a little bit more towards a Microsoft driven um, industry change that's happening uh, and being accelerated with COVID. So before COVID, um, and uh, I still believe that this is the normal uh, rate that we'll return back to, uh, what's happened is traditionally, IT has been um, led by the business to achieve certain things. So if you were to ask a CEO or you were to ask um, different types of people within the C-suite, um, what is it that they're doing to essentially drive and improve the business? Um, they're going to emphasize that the, what they want IT to do, what they want pretty much most of IT to do, is to focus on transformation. So innovation, deliver new solutions, deliver new ways of working, those kinds of things. That's still true, by the way, even during COVID. It's just shifted in that there's 
a, at least a little bit more of a, an understanding that as a digital first responder, you're going to be tackling some other firefighting things a little bit more in the short term. Um, the second piece to that is that um, most of these uh, executives and leaders, and this is true across like, you know, I'm using Infotech here, but if you look at any research, it's pretty consistent. They're expecting uh, less and less effort to be spent on firefighting, support, traditional support modeling, things like that, and optimization, um, and more and more, again, towards uh, transformation and innovation. So what does that mean? It means that where most organizations want us to go is not where IT is performing today, especially with COVID, which is kind of throwing a wrench into those plans. And so if you were to ask uh, an IT leader, like if you said, hey, IT director, IT manager, or even, you know, an architect or somebody else working in IT, um, they would give you a very different response, right? Their perspective is going to be, well, we've pretty much spent all of our time firefighting. We have a bunch of struggles and uh, instability issues with legacy technology. Um, sometimes we get into optimization um, and expansion, but it's relatively light compared to the rest of our workload. And this is where most of the challenges exist um, today because what Microsoft will pitch and talk about a lot is this stuff, the transformation stuff, Project Cortex, and you can use all these new AI tools and things like that. But where our organizations are is we're still just trying to get people um, to stop using, you know, email for everything or to, you know, use newer technology and, you know, for the love of God, stop putting everything on your desktop or something like that. So so these are the the juxtaposition that we're in. And what's oh. useful about, oh, go ahead. Is there a question? Oh. Sorry, Richard. Sorry, I am taking you up on your uh, request to feel free to interrupt. Just out of curious, and even though you did say, of course, the source is Infotech, is this normalized by business sector, by industry, or Correct. what is the more? Oh, okay. So there's not really a prevalent industry based no. on. So, so I've I've dug into this data pretty extensively, um, and it's pretty hard actually for me to pull it up without going through like a bunch of stuff. So the gist of it is um, there's certainly a little bit of a difference in um, what we'll call um, conservative industries. So like insurance, um, banking, things like that. But actually, uh, that's uh, sorry, that's more on this side. Right. But what we actually see is the business side is consistent. In fact, if anything, it's further up the, the stream. So you'll see much higher numbers in these first two. And I think the reason for that is because a lot of them are outwards facing. Right. So they think of the consumer or customer experience and then they think of how that translates to technology. Right. Whereas in IT, we think of internal facing. And so most of the time we're focusing on like, OK, what are the things that are going to improve um, behaviors and digital outcomes internally versus externally? And so, again, again, I think that's why they're there's a bit of this transition uh, across the two. So I, I wouldn't blame it entirely just on like expectations and, you know, reality or things like that, but it is very consistent across the industry. Um, you know, slight, slight deviations here and there. And what's nice with Infotech and a few others is they actually have that breakdown where you can actually look at it per industry. Um, the COVID difference has been fascinating to see um, businesses. What we're seeing is a greater acceptance, whereas this is a friction point. Um, at the beginning of this year before COVID hit, um, this was actually a pretty dominant discussion in a lot of of um, CIO and uh, executive roundtables that I was a part in, where um, really organizations in 2020 had a vision where they really had to, you know, up their game. They really had to start to um, embrace AI and other things. What's happened now is it's a different of a different focus. Um, and two different big points here. Um, don't underestimate uh, that the emphasis is still on innovation because what organizations are now doing is they understand, um, unfortunately, that there's a recession that's tied with COVID. And so um, when they come back up out of that, everyone has to do more with less. So the inward focus of IT, right, if we think of like digital workplace uh, elements and investments, what we see there is actually a lot of the organizations at least that are looking forward instead of just you know tackling the the day-to-day -day, um, when they're looking forward they're saying hey we want to figure out a way to get people to be more efficient better with the technologies that we have so that we can essentially not hire back a lot of those people and I'm sorry I know that these are sensitive subjects but um, but that's essentially what's happening now so what you'll actually see is um, uh, and we see this every time there's a recession as well but you see the same sort of pattern happening now where there's a much greater emphasis on hey we need to get really good at using uh, teams we need to get really good our intranets need to be improved we need to do all these inward focus digital excellence motions because um, arguably that's one of the only ways that we can get people to do more with less right it's really difficult for you to stretch and scale uh, as an individual employee unless you have tools that essentially do some of the work for you or simplify it or do things of that nature so um, so that's why there's uh, I, I would suggest that you see a greater spend on some of those activities in the short term and if you're in an organization and you're you know you're thinking about your job or your future I think it's really important to align with um, those kinds of initiatives right how do we you know essentially do more with less and, and achieve greater results 
results. Um, so it's like a, a quick digression there. So one way of looking at this, um, just so you have a metric or you can do some re research on your own on this, is um, we all know of customer sat. So we've had customer sat for a long time. A newer uh, metric that's been uh, pretty dominant for quite a while now is customer effort scoring. So the idea between these, in case you haven't heard of this, uh, everyone I think knows what customer sat is, lagging indicator, you know, how satisfied are you, et cetera. Customer effort score is a leading indicator. What that means is essentially what happens is when you go to a website and you go to purchase a product, let's say, um, what they track is how hard is it for you to purchase that product. Now, not just the click-throughs and the obvious path, but even like how hard is it for you to make the decision? Do you have the research? Do you have the information available? You know, do you have the ratings, the reviews, the pricing comparisons? Do you have everything that you need to, to make an effective decision there? And so what you see a lot of times um, with uh, organizations is we use uh, employee sat as a pretty dominant discussion point when we think of you know, how effective we are performing, especially even if you take employee sat with technology, and that's a lagging indicator. Instead, what you're seeing is, um, we'll say, more forward thinking or innovative organizations, they're shifting their focus towards this thing called employee effort scoring. Um, and there's some really good examples of this. Um, so there's a very large 150,000 uh, person um, pharmaceutical organization, uh, that's three letters. So what they're doing as an example is um, they have a making it better or making it uh, uh, easier group uh, at an organizational level. So this is like outside of IT, their own little unit. And what they're focused on is making it easier. A lot of those are digital initiatives. Think of like intranets, um, digital workplace productivity, those types of initiatives. But some of them are facility uh, scenarios, right? It's like how easy is it to go into work or secure facilities or to do other things like that. And what you do is when you start to think about how can we track employee effort, um, it starts to create a pretty compelling and useful discussion because when when you start to break it down, you can actually track this pretty effectively. You take a business process today and how hard and how long does it take. You can take usability studies um, and um, senses of not just satisfaction with the end result, but like satisfaction with the, like how hard it is to get certain things done. And then you can kind of um, zero in on a few of those, map it all out, and then improve um, uh, you know an outcome on the other end. Um, and what's useful about this is when you think of employee effort scoring, if you can start to align your own projects and things that you're working on with more of an employee effort score versus a SAT discussion, um, you're already moving in in the right direction because now you're starting to talk about like how do we proactively uh, engage, how do we proactively improve things within organizations. So I thought that between these two things, it would be a good um, place for you guys to start if you're getting into some of these trends. And um, and I'll use uh, another example in a moment um, after I talk about Power Platform. So um, let's talk about uh, why Power Platform fits much better with employee effort score versus employee sat, right? So in Power Platform is Power Apps, Power Automate, um, Power BI, um, Power Agents, et cetera. Um, I almost said something else. Um, I have no idea if that'll be announced next week. So uh, I caught myself, even though this is recorded. Um, so so uh, essentially, if we look at the industry as well, um, again, before COVID, uh, we actually see this uh, slightly going the other way. So this is uh, this is one that's been affected by COVID right now. So uh, IT operational spending, that's like, you know, uh, keeping all your licensing, um, investing in migration projects, all that stuff that you're typically familiar with. Um, that spending was expected to increase about 3% overall in 2020, if you look at um, at least uh, core markets, North American, et cetera. Um, the line of business spending was expected to increase by more than 50%, right? I don't think this is surprising. I think most of you guys have been feeling this for a long time, um, but it, it show, it's a very important stat. What's happened with COVID is we've seen IT operational spending increase further um, than 3%, which makes sense, right? There's a lot of these core investments that are going on, but we've also seen line of business spending especially as it relates to technology, increase uh, as well. And uh, the numbers aren't finalized, but of the studies that I've seen uh, and of the data that I've seen, it seems to be pretty strong suggesting that this correlation isn't that far off. So it might be like 6% to 50% growth, like if you were to aggregate it up, but it's still very, very dominant that the growth uh, opportunity is in line of business spending. What does this mean? It means if you haven't gotten on the power platform bandwagon, um, you really need to understand it and the way it's going to impact uh, organizations. If you look at a traditional IT project, right, a lot of times that has to be done by IT because you have domain expertise, you have to hire very particular people, you want it in-house, at least some of these expertise in-house because you need to own it. Um, there's too much risk with the ex, um, kind of outsourcing some of that. It's very different with these kind of uh, rapid applications, rapid automation solutions um, that arguably power apps and power automate especially are, are really uh, effective at. And so what we're seeing is um, 
if you're you know CRM or ERP adjacent, you've already seen this trend. Uh, a lot of the consulting work or the internal um, development work that you're doing is shifted towards these kind of rapid, quick solutions that integrate a few systems or solve a particular problem. And um, what we're seeing is that starting to now transition even into the digital workplace adjacent space, right? So um, you know even when we talk about um, baseline things that we would traditionally do with an internet or you know uh, an internet adjacent solution or something, now that's shifting into the power platform. Um, and if it's you know if it's not power platform it's something equivalent right in the marketplace um, so uh, so that's a really important uh, kind of trend to be aware of and essentially my strong recommendation um, that if you were a SharePoint person and you rode that SharePoint wave um, back in 2006 2007 2008 like essentially beyond that point if you were in SharePoint you you did very well right from a career perspective and opportunities um, it's going to be the same thing with the power platform space right now in, in my opinion uh, all right, so I mentioned this employee effort score. I said I'd give you at least one example. Um, I want to use uh, the idea of my analytics, and I want to use workplace analytics as my two uh, catch points here. Um, everyone uh, who has an E1 and above has my analytics. It's part of the baseline licensing. Um, it's quite uh, useful, especially during COVID. So we've seen a lot of customers um, use this quite effectively where during COVID, uh, let's talk about meetings, right? Meetings are, are increasing by a substantial amount during COVID. Meetings are less uh, effectively managed. Meetings are less effectively coordinated before the meeting, right? Think of agendas and structure. So essentially people are losing focus time because they're being pulled into meetings all the time, um, mainly because people are just learning how to work more effectively digitally versus like going into your office and bothering you, et cetera. So, so this is causing a bit of a, uh, an issue um, in a lot of organizations. And so one of the things that my analytics does a good job of is it gives you uh, insights around focus hours. Another big one is around networks and who you work with, who you might not have interacted with over a period of time. Uh, I can't show mine because I did check today and it shows too many, um, secret things, I guess, uh, for confidentiality. But uh, trust me on it that uh, I do use it uh, pretty much every week. I like the insights capability. So you can add an add-in. Um, are they still called add-ins? You can add an add-in to Outlook. Um, and essentially, it gives you a sort of targeted personalized version of my analytics inside of the Outlook experience. And uh, it's incredibly useful. Uh, it always tells me about things I've forgotten about, actions that in an email I said, yeah, I'll get to this for you or I'll help you with this. And then I totally forgotten about it. And then it'll say, hey, you promised or you made this statement last week. Is this, have you done it yet? Um, and so it's really helpful for things like that. And then even little things like if you're planning to have uh, away time. Uh, so um, with my my next child that's coming, I was actually planning that and I forgot to move a bunch of stuff out of my calendar. So um, so again, it's it's reminding me like not just saying that like, you need to move these things out of your calendar. It looks like you have redundant things when you're supposed to be off. But by the way, do you want us to do that with you? So it gives you like a little fluid experience where you can do that. Um, and then lastly, in the middle here, um, one of my favorite ones, uh, anyone who's been, uh, we'll say remote working for a long time, uh, we all fall into this trap where all of a sudden it's, you know, nine o'clock or 11 o'clock even at night and I'm working away at something. And then I email uh, my customers or I email my uh, team because I'm like, yeah, this is done. And then um, unfortunately, sometimes uh, a team member who I don't know well enough that I haven't said ignore my emails, um, they might see it at like 1130 at night and you know, they get anxious because they're like, oh, I need to read this right now. Is it important? Is it not? Um, and so it's really useful to delay your send to, you know, the next morning, right? If you're Eastern before 9 a.m., maybe 7 a.m., 8 a.m., whatever. I don't mind people being stressed in the morning, just not uh, late at night. So um, so doing delay send is, is something that takes mental effort. I have to remember to do it. Here, what's happening is it's saying, hey, I, I think you probably should be doing that. You're probably making a mistake here. Um, Trust me when I say that Camel and I have literally, uh, my business partner and I have switched how we use Outlook and we use Outlook online just for this feature. It literally uh, makes a big difference in employee, uh, um, you know, impact. Um, so here's just some pictures. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I really like uh, my analytics for the fact that if I start getting too busy because I'm getting sucked up into multiple meetings, that it actually asks if I want to book time to block completely off. Yes. Because I have a bad habit of actually saying yes to almost everything because I want to be helpful and end up uh, burying my day job. And I'm really bad for last minute meetings because I'm uh, often in a more outside focused role. And so the PMO team hates that I always keep throwing meetings and grabbing people from different things, right? So it's telling me stop doing that. And I have actually changed my behavior from that. So exactly, like everyone on this call, if, if you're not playing with this and really exploring it, I, I really encourage, especially this little insights one is really easy to start getting used to. Um, it makes a difference. And what's neat about this is you can create campaigns internally and use these um, tools. But it's a good example of um, making people more 
more digitally efficient, which goes back to, you know, the initiatives and goals of the organization and it's using AI and a bunch of other stuff. Plus it's E1, so everyone has it. Let's talk about something that costs oh. money. Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to add in, I would also um, uh, um, echo the um, the brilliance of the My Analytics. I also leverage it. And just on a side note with the delay send, that's also helpful, especially if you either have colleagues or clients that are in countries where um, it may be out of compliance if you send them a communication after business hours. Yeah. Good call out uh, for European and certain uh, countries. Yeah, very good call out. Um, another key call out here is um, just in case I haven't mentioned it, my analytics does have programs, um, so models that you can use um, where you can kind of track teams and do things like that. So that if you haven't looked into this stuff, there's some, some homework for you guys to look into there. I want to talk about this from an organizational perspective because this gets more to like the industry um, trend. So what's also happening in organizations um, is at first, everyone was just focusing on how the heck do we enable people to be, work remotely and, you know, using Teams and using these meetings and things like that. Now what we're seeing is a greater emphasis on uh, improving meeting quality is a really good example right now with COVID. It's becoming a really dominant discussion um, within organizations, at least, you know, organizations that are, are not dealing with the firefighting as an example. Um, but there is this thing called workplace analytics that um, has a bunch of predefined uh, models um, in which it, it extracts information from your emails, um, it extracts information from teams and your meetings, it extracts information from SharePoint and a bunch of other sources, amalgamates it together um, with, you know, anonymization, you know, so it's never more than, um, never less than five people right within their settings and then essentially allows the organization to get insights they never could get before because everything's tracked in the cloud right every interaction is tracked in the cloud so what we see here as an example is for meetings it'll give and i'll, I'll dig deeper into this it'll give insights into like what's multitasking hours what are conflicting hours redundant hours and things like that within meetings you can dig into a department you can dig into essentially as long as it's not five or less people you can dig into different metrics there management coaching this is a huge one uh, during COVID. a lot of organizations um good managers as we know um have a lot of one-on-ones so you have like at least a monthly cadence where you do a dedicated one-on-one -on -one where you're really trying to understand like how's it going what's working what's not working blah 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 so typical questions we know that during uh, the transition to COVID, a lot of these managers are stressed with just getting like their projects done and a bunch of other things so they're not making as much time for this um that's a real trend that we're seeing in the industry so you can actually see that and then you can take action like what can we do to encourage people to do more one-on-ones which uh, departments or areas of the business are doing less of this maybe we can do from like a top-down perspective um set expectations and help people frame that better uh so management coaching is a great example um, that's affected today. Internal networks is another big one. Unfortunately, we are in a time where some organizations are uh, dropping people, right? Um, having to have individuals depart and leave. Uh, go away thing um, and then other times uh, organizations are doing the opposite they're acquiring it's a you know especially with recessions we see this cycle so um, when you have a lot of that going on it's really important to know you know what's how networked is this group within the organization um, when they come in a lot of people have very weak networks and we know retention uh, effectiveness and other things are all driven by having your network internally so so these are really useful metrics everything in here external collaboration is a pretty obvious one as well everything in here is actionable useful insights that every organization should want to have and the beauty of um, the way that this is licensed is you could actually start to explore this without you know purchasing it for all employees at least right away um, so some other things here let's talk about meetings for a moment and this is um, by the way better than what I'm showing in the demos I just can't ever remember what's like public preview and what's not so um, there's a lot of cool innovation in the workplace analytics team we'll put it at that um, hopefully next week they'll have better slides to talk about so uh, so here we have essentially the meeting summary and so if we dig a little bit deeper into quality of meetings we can see that there's kind of different things that impact the quality of meetings um, so let's let's talk about those uh, different aspects one is uh, the you know are uh, are we effectively utilizing the people that are attending the meetings um, we already mentioned this is a big problem um, during covid where we have too many people thrown onto meetings that they really shouldn't be a part of um, so that's a bit of a problem another big one is um, the length of the meeting so we all know meetings that are really long you know they they're very challenging for employees so can we split up meetings a little bit more provide people time for breaks you wouldn't believe how many times i work with customers where um, a specific stakeholder really doesn't understand the concept of breaks and like 
I can see people squirming in their seat waiting for like an opportunity. So there's lots of benefits in, in thinking through these things. Redundant meeting hours is where you might have two meetings booked at the same time, or you actually might be cycling through the meetings. Or finally, um, there's another one which is like multitasking. Yeah, there we go. Where you sent an email during the meeting um, and the email wasn't to the people in the meeting, right? So we can clearly see you're not actually active in this meeting. You must have written an email or done something else. Uh, there, so like that's a good example of multitasking. That means that the meeting was less effective, meaning most likely you probably didn't need to be in that part of the meeting. Maybe another part of it, maybe you should have watched the recording later, but you get the idea. Now I'm, I'm taking uh, specific uh, scenarios and applying it here. Here, obviously, we're not going to make those judgment calls. We're just saying like, where do these metrics come from and what might they represent, right? Um, and then we take our, our thesis, our ideas, and then our hypothesis, and then we approve it um, through a bunch of other techniques on the back end. But um, really, really powerful data that allows you to make some really interesting decisions. So let's say you want to action it. Um, I want to reduce uh, the effective uh, the, I want to reduce the ineffective meetings that are going on. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some active programs. I'm going to do marketing. I'm going to target them because they have this really big problem where people are essentially always emailing and doing other stuff in, when they're in meetings. So we're going to essentially um, do some sort of proactive training. We're going to reach out to some people. Um, we're actually going to coach uh, on purpose some of the leaders in marketing so they learn you know, these new behaviors and a bunch of other patterns like that. Uh, another one that we're going to do is we're going to reduce the number of meetings uh, period. So uh, not just like reducing the stuff around it like the other things that are going on but we're going to actually really make the more meetings more focused so we're going to work with them proactively from an IT perspective or whoever we represent and then engineering uh, we have this mastery program where they have a lot of these meetings and they're important but um, the way that they're structured with agendas and other things could be improved so we're going to target that whatever it is so you come up with your programs you execute those and then you essentially track the program's effectiveness is it reducing you know the average number of times a week um, uh, for meetings in general if that was one of the outcomes you're trying to drive um, are you looking at less of those um, you know doubling up of meetings are you looking at you know more productive meetings because people aren't doing things during the meetings etc um, so this is sort of the idea is you create your own uh, almost programs and then you run them against these uh, behavior metrics within the organization questions are there settable goals in there Absolutely. So um, you, you obviously define it. One of the things that I'm using here is I'm using a pretty simple example that doesn't really use outside data. In real world, we almost always use outside data too, like attainment, um, effectiveness of that. So like in marketing, we might look at, you know, essentially the effectiveness of the marketing spend that we have, like how how much are we producing, right? And there's different ways you can measure that from a marketing perspective. Um, so you would align that data on top. So this, this wouldn't just be these metrics, there'd be other metrics we're tracking as well um, alongside them to get that better view. Yeah, and it supports all this, which is nice, um, the workplace analytics stuff. So, you know, hopefully, oh, go ahead. Just quick question, does it support multiple tenants for those that are consultants that have? Um, yes and no. So, yes, you can do that. Um, uh, where you might create industry guidance, but you're almost getting to what Microsoft's doing anyways. Um, so without, uh, I don't know how to not talk about NDA stuff there. So um, obviously Microsoft has some rich data that can be anonymized here um, on behaviors. And we know that they're already using that because you see examples of that with innovation like, hey, you know, that example of you should delay send, right? We know that um, they have data that helps them make some judgment calls and that that data is used in your tenant along with your own behaviors and your own tenant data. Um, so, so there is some privacy elements here that are important to know that Microsoft's taking very careful and the right steps um, to make sure that they're always respecting it. As a consultant, um, you can't really take that behavior data out because it's owned by the organization. So the best you could maybe get is you uh, could abstract your understanding of the industry trend, and then you could apply that to different customers. So you could have your own data set that you apply on top of the Microsoft data set, almost like an industry baseline, um, and then that could work. So there are um, uh, there are analyst firms, as an example, that explore this today um, with customers. Um, uh, or I don't know if that was private, but anyways, there's there's definitely patterns like that, but it's really rarely um, done by most consultancies, unless you know you're like the the big three type consultancies. Yeah. Um, but what's neat is it's a different change, right? We have a very different way in which we're tackling uh, essentially the digital workplace efficiency outcomes. So I'm going to talk about aligning with Microsoft. Um, this is pretty easy stuff. I think all of you have looked at um, the Microsoft roadmaps. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I don't have a question, but for Dimitri, Mike, or David, 
I noticed that someone has their hand raised. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Robert, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I just, um, you showed my analytics and then you went into workplace analytics and I'm, I did. I'm wondering how, how you got there. Yeah, you mean like from a flow of the presentation or you mean just like how do you access well, workplace? How do you analytics? access the workplace? Got it. Uh, analytics. So this um, this one, like I said, E1 and above, um, you're, you're all in. Um, this yeah. one is a separate license. So you essentially purchase it. Um, uh, you have to uh, you have to enable it. There's, uh, there's definitely a benefit the larger you are, right? Because of the five uh, limit for the users, and honestly, just from a behavior excellence perspective, uh, most of the stuff you'd want to impact, you could do pretty easily in a couple hundred people because you can enact that change with a person. Like a person can go and champion and change that. When you get into um, thousands or tens of thousands of users, that's where this really uh, shines, right? In terms of a, a value proposition. And then you can buy uh, essentially an add-on SKU or you know, there's other methods essentially to buy it. So, um, so it is a separate purchase price, but what's I think interesting about it is Microsoft's not the only organization doing this. In the cloud, what we're seeing is this shift where um, the long-term potential value of the cloud could be more and more this kind of stuff Right then, the traditional like, can I do X or Y? Can I join a meeting? Can I do like the basics of, of those things? Because when you do this stuff and you make it um, enabled by the organization, not just Microsoft's, you know, excellence, then you start to enable more innovation in that industry and for those companies. And this data is actually very valuable to organizations, right? Um, especially large ones today. So, um, so yeah, it's again typically you drive this purchase if you're serious about this. You would purchase it based on like an outcome like sales outcomes or something else you're trying to drive like a major KPI and you just you essentially tell the the story of how you're going to measure that with this data alongside some other data um and the and so, and those, those are well worth it yeah thank you the my analytics is available to everyone it's available at e1 and above correct uh and it's for the individual use case like so education, it's free for benefit. education has it too uh, I don't remember A1, uh, et cetera, for my analytics, so I'd have to double check it, but it would be an easy check to essentially confirm. Okay, uh, thank yeah. you. Uh, same thing with government. I can never remember the differences. Um, hmm. So uh, Microsoft 365 has a roadmap. If you've never seen it, I really encourage you to go to it. A few things that are really useful about the roadmap, um, if you've never explored it, there's actually a way to see what's recently changed. So um, let me actually just pull it up. So if I go to the roadmap right now, uh, I, I use this all the time um, personally because it's really a useful way to keep track of what's been changing. So, um, oh, okay, thanks, thanks, Outlaw. Let me go back. Don't sign in to Office for some reason as a redirect. Okay, good. Um, so here we have the roadmap. Um, a few things that are really cool here is this new and updated features, like unbelievably helpful. Um, and everything eventually makes it to the roadmap. That's we'll call it significant. There is definitely many features, tweaks, things like that, that don't go into here, uh, at least not as a named item. Um, so, so do note that there's a lot of stuff that kind of slips through the cracks, but it's not like when I say major, it's not a huge amount of engineering effort that went behind it, right? Um, it's, you know, improving like the, the picture quality for um, video inside of uh, Teams. That's probably not a major item unless there's something else that they're doing dynamically with that. Um, so this is really helpful, but here's the problem with this. If I am not as technically inclined and I do a search for something like the word intranet, this doesn't help me at all because these aren't the intranet, you know, innovative features that Microsoft's delivering. These are just a few that had the word intranet within their descriptions, right? We know that the intranet is being improved by web parts, by changes in Microsoft Teams, the way that we can bring um, intranets into Microsoft Teams now in new ways. There's a whole lot of stuff that someone technical has to map um, for an understanding of these roadmaps, but it's still a really useful resource if you've never explored it. Or if you don't really look at this, I would really encourage maybe just like once every month, you don't have to kill yourself but once every month just to check because once you've done it once you've read through this and you essentially track um, you can get up to speed really quickly there's not that many changes within a month as an example let me just get rid of the word internet just to prove it um, so you know you can't I guess change last month well, that was a bad example because of ignite uh, <laughs> ignite is happening and there's a lot of announcement changes but normally it's a much less that changes within a month um, so let's talk about the other method uh, oh, well, oh, go ahead just an, uh, just an ad, and I know it probably would never ha happen, but it could ever always be a wish list with the roadmap. If the roadmap updates would be linked to user voice features that have been suggested and implemented. 
Yes, so I will comment on that <laughs> for now <laughs> because of uh, the team members who are probably going to watch this. But um, yes, it is a challenge and um, they are aware of it. I'll put it that way for Microsoft. Um, and they want to make a clear story for customers for sure. So if we, if we look at something like Microsoft Teams, um, Microsoft Teams or SharePoint or you name it, also has this thing called user voice. If, you've, if you haven't explored this um, and you are somebody who you know treats themselves as they want to be an expert or they are an expert in Teams or SharePoint, you name it, um, I really think you need to look at these user voice items. One, it tells you the gaps, right? So if someone puts a user voice item here, it's highly likely that it is a, a gap in the platform, right? Um, and just to prove that there are many, so we'll go to the SharePoint user voice. Um, there are many gaps in the platform that have not been addressed yet, but uh, so you can get a sense of like, what are the challenges in the platform? So let's go, uh, Dev's gonna be actually a bit dicey. Let's do, um, Let's just use search. So in search, we can see that a modern SharePoint search center um, was something that people have been asking for. We can see that Microsoft's working on it. And then you can see an engineering update essentially that's public around where their status is and how they're dealing with it. So this becomes really helpful for a few reasons. One, you can actually often get an answer. Um, a lot of things are flagged where Microsoft has responded that either it's in process, they're thinking about it, like some sort of status to acknowledge like where they are in their product life cycle. Um, and so it, it essentially can give you a lot more insight if you want to get kind of before it gets into the roadmap. Um, the other reason it's really helpful is those pain points, those gaps are things that you're going to run into. If you're an analyst, if you're a, um, an information architect, if you're one of these kinds of resources that needs to help the organization be successful with these technologies, um, these kinds of pain points are going to come up. Someone's going to ask you a question, um, do a search on user voice to double check, and you'll probably find uh, someone else has ran into that, and it may be that there's a, a limitation around the technology. Um, so knowing that allows you to work around it, because often in the comments for these, people will explain what they're doing to work around these gaps today. All right, cool. And so if, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, if you uh, if you vote on any of them, not only do you help uh, kind of raise it up the uh, the poll for Microsoft to view it, but anytime there's an update from uh, from Microsoft, you get an email about it. So it isn't quite tied in with the roadmap, but a bunch of user voice things I voted on, I've like gotten emails saying that they're in development right now. Yeah, very, very helpful for that kind of tracking. And, and most of the time, if you're going all the way there and you're voting on it, it's been important to you. So it's nice to have that follow on, right? As soon as, soon as it gets resolved. Um, and also one of the things that we offer as a service for this user group <clears throat> is uh, the power of our social media accounts. So if you guys find something that you feel is really important to be voted up, send it to us and we'll tweet it out. I love it. I love yeah. it. Like, and a human a, a, a best practice with using user voice or the power platform refers it to as ideas because I don't think they use the user voice platform. Don't, I don't know why, but I've noticed that. But is to search for your idea first before putting in a new idea for that very reason. Because yeah, please. Yeah, don't okay. create redundancy. They do try and uh, correct that in the back end, but it's really it's not a high priority. So yes, please, please do that so that you're not um, splitting votes for sure. Um, and then, you know, uh, I was going to make a comment about November, but I will leave politics to the side. All right. So um, <laughs> another thing here is uh, um, the uh, emphasis on uh, Microsoft making it a little bit easier to understand what you have out of the box and how to utilize it. So the lookbook designs, um, I, I originally put these are SharePoint. Um, there is important to note that they are reframing lookbooks. Um, lookbooks is now no longer called SharePoint, even though that's all that's there right now. There is some cool ideas there. You guys can start to see where that might be inspired to go. Um, anyways, so that's enough hinting. Uh, in here, there's some really, really great examples. And what's excellent about these examples, um, and I'm really, really happy with how Microsoft did this, is you can just add them to your own tenant um, and you can explore them and play with them yourself. And another thing I really love about these examples is they totally show how difficult SharePoint is in certain categories, like intranets as an example, where we have news, 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 events, news, 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 events, which is actually pretty common if you're using